Welcome to the Informed Pregnancy and Parenting Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Elliot Berlin, and I'm joined by today's co-host, toddler mom and stylist, Casey Bixby. Hello. Welcome back. Thanks. Our guest today is pelvic health and rehabilitation specialist, Stephanie Prendergast. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. I'm so excited that you're here because I think there's too much unknown about pelvic health. Um, and it's like this big mystery. Nobody's really sure what what the pelvic floor is, what the core is, and how you take care of it uh, until something goes really wrong with it. And even then, I think oftentimes they don't realize what happened until uh, much later than they could have taken care of it. So uh, I have a lot of questions when I told our patients we're having you on. They submitted questions, so I have some questions to ask based on that. And I think that listeners are going to get a lot of valuable information here. So thanks for being here. Um, you, I just want to talk a little bit about your, your background. Um, a lot of our, most of our listeners and their partners are expecting or recently had babies and pelvic health and rehab is really important to them. It's under discussed and it's misunderstood. In our office, we spend a lot of our day working on pelvic health. Um, Most of our patients in the office are pre or postnatal, and we're trying to improve the structure so that they have better function. Um, In our work, we have really good synergy with uh, physical therapists who specialize in pelvic floor health, but not all physical therapists do Mm -hmm. get training in pelvic floor health. So I'd love to find out more about your background in training and how you worked into this specialty because you're kind of known as the guru. Thank you. So I received my master's degree um, from the Medical College of Pennsylvania in Hammond University. And at the time I graduated, I didn't know that pelvic floor physical therapy was even a specialty within the field. I worked for a year in orthopedics, was a little less than enchanted by it, we can say. Um, when people said things to me like, when I run 24 miles, my knee hurts. <laughs> my thought was, don't run 24 miles. <laughs> oh, yeah. and coming to the Bay Area you sound from a lot Philadelphia. Like my nutritionist. Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> and then, a year, about a year into my career, I met a urologist who specialized in non obstetric pelvic pain disorders. And what that meant is there were men and women um, suffering from things like urinary urgency, frequency, genital itching, in the absence of an infection. Infection, painful intercourse, the inability to sit down, the inability to exercise. Um, and it was plaguing people in their 20s and 30s. Mm-hmm. And they were essentially disabled. It was painful to wear pants. It was hard to go to the bathroom. They couldn't engage in sexual intercourse. To me, that was much more interesting mm-hmm. than knees and ankles and shoulders. And so basically, there is no physical therapy education for pelvic floor rehab still currently today in physical therapy schools, so all of the training has to come from postgraduate continuing education. So the urologist that I worked with from 2001 until 2006, as well as my mentor, Rhonda Cotterinos, who's a pelvic floor physical therapist in Chicago, was largely responsible for giving me the foundation to be able to treat men and women with mm-hmm. pelvic pain. So you were with an MD? I was urologist? working with a physician, correct. Mm-hmm. And so he had discovered that his surgeries and medications weren't working for the types of symptoms that I just described, Mm -hmm. urinary urgency, frequency, difficulty starting the urinary stream, painful intercourse, post-ejaculatory pain in gentlemen. And what he came to realize is the reason the medications and surgeries weren't working is because there was a muscular and a nerve issue inside the pelvic floor that was compressing things like the bladder, the urethra, Mm. squeezing the opening of the vagina, and it was actually a neuromuscular problem that was causing these types of issues. And you're talking about young, healthy people. Yes. The patients who have pelvic pain, again, non-obstetrics, are typically in their 20s and 30s and 40s. Mm. Mm-hmm. And they don't know where it's coming from? There's no. Is there a trauma that precedes it? Yes. So there's generally four categories that can render somebody into these situations. And what's tricky about them is the symptoms, as I just described, they don't sound like a muscular issue. They sound like a yeast infection. They sound like a urinary tract infection. And so in the pelvic floor, what's tricky about it is those muscles can mimic problems coming from the surrounding organs. So typically how these things develop, um, let's take men because it's slightly easier, it's almost always a biomechanical problem. And so let's say one gentleman rides a bike and has numbness in the saddle area and genital numbness following. 
the same, another person could do the same bike ride and not have symptoms. It's really about their predisposing anatomy. Mm -hmm. And if they're doing something that pushes their body past what their anatomy can handle. And so in some cases, everyone asks, why can somebody else ride their bike 20 miles and I can't ride mine one? It's usually their anatomic predisposition that renders, let's say, the pudendal nerve a little bit closer to where the seat is that can compress the nerve and result in the types of symptoms I just described. Mm. Another trigger for our male patients can be things like squats and CrossFit, exceeding the weight that their pelvic floor can handle. In our female patients, it's a little more complicated because the, the vulvovaginal area is also sensitive to hormones, infection, and different diseases than male anatomy. Mm -hmm. So in female patients, um, one of the onsets could be things like endometriosis, mm -hmm. painful periods, repetitive urinary tract and yeast infections can result in a disease process causing secondary somatic consequences. So the pelvic floor muscles and the pudendal nerve could get irritated in response to either an ongoing disease like endometriosis or something like an active infection like a yeast infection. So it's a secondary, it's building on itself. Right. You have an initial problem that's not pelvic floor and, and then, then it starts to affect the pelvic floor as well. Because a yeast infection, for example, is itchy. And so let's say that you've had a series of those in a row, your muscles will tighten in response to the irritation mm -hmm. from the itch. And even after the infection has cleared, if your muscles aren't able to relax afterwards, now you're still symptomatic in the absence of infection, mm -hmm. right. which is unfortunate because doctors tend to want to just give another round of the medication when in fact there may not be an infection, so therefore the medication isn't going to work. Now now it starts to become very concerning for patients. And the medication right. will over medicating causes other problems. And exactly. And so what we can see is let's take the example of urinary tract infections. If people are repetitively given antibiotics, that disrupts the gut. So in addition to having a bladder infection, then there's GI distress. Both of those factors can lead into pelvic floor consequences that can perpetuate the symptoms once the infection has cleared as one of the three causes in women. Wow. I, and I want to get to the other two causes as well. Um, but I feel like we should back up a tiny bit and just talk about, because we're using terms like pelvic floor. Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of people don't even know what the pelvic floor is. So if you could just tell us more about the structure itself, what, what constitutes the pelvic floor and is it different for men and women? Yes. So it is actually relatively similar in men and women. It's just the entry points are slightly different. Mm -hmm. So the pelvic floor muscles are a group of muscles that run from the pubic bone back to the tailbone, and they support the bladder, the uterus, the rectum travels through the pelvic floor. In women, obviously, there's three outlet points, so the urethra, the vagina, and the rectum. Um, in the man, the urethra obviously exits out through the penis, but also the rectum is a way to access the pelvic floor in our male patients. Now, these muscles are different than every other muscle in the body because they also have autonomic innervation. So most of the muscles that you think of in your arms or your back have sensory and motor innervation. Mm -hmm. But with the pelvic floor, just like with your breath, it has the ability to have some tone and function without you thinking about it. Hmm. So you have the option, for example, if you're breathing, to take an additional breath and override your body's natural breathing process. You can do the same thing with the pelvic floor. It's going to exist on its own and function and prevent you from leaking urine and stool. But if you wanted to, you could squeeze it or you could relax it to allow allow yourself to go to the bathroom. Right. So it's interesting in that regard because there's some control that you can override, but also it tends to have its own mm -hmm. brain. Sort if of you like will. breathing. Hmm. Just like breathing. Yeah. Exactly. So uh, the is the function of the pelvic floor, it, it, I'm, you sort of picture a hammock. That's a good example. And um, and the organs, those genital organs are kind of resting on the hammock. So is, is the punk f primary function to support those organs? One of the main functions is to support the uterus, the bladder, and the rectum, but it's also responsible for orgasm and sexual function, as well as helping us maintain continence. So the reason we don't leak urine and stool in a normal function pelvic floor is because those muscles actually increase in tone as urine fills the bladder or if stool fills the rectum to keep us continent. Mm -hmm. And as we're going to discuss later, when there are issues with the pelvic floor, we lose our ability to control those functions. Got it. Um, in, you were just talking about different entry points. That's if you are going to do therapy on them? 
Correct. If you were going to do a manual exam and when women go to the gynecologist, it's typically through the vagina. It can be transanal as well. And in gentlemen, it's transanal access to the pelvic floor muscles. So in women, you can you can get in more access, yes. better access, I imagine. Yes. Than men. Um, aside from pregnancy, which we'll talk about later, are there things that we should do to take care to maintain the pelvic floor? So the basic, I was thinking about this question because how can people know if things are functioning normally Mm -hmm. or not was a thought that I had as I was coming here. So if you have symptoms such as constipation, what's quote, quote, called the shy bladder, Mm -hmm. if there's ever pain with intercourse, none of those things are normal, even Mm -hmm. though they are common. Is the shy bladder pain with intercourse? Is that the same thing? Separate. I'm sorry. Shy bladder. People feeling like they can't start their urine stream. They feel like it's challenging to do so. That's usually a symptom of pelvic floor hypertonus, Mm -hmm. but maybe not enough to drive you to go to the doctor. In men and women? In both men and women. But in men, does the prostate get involved? Well, the prostate is a structure within and near the pelvic floor, but typically, especially in our younger gentlemen with these symptoms, the it's prostate not is not prostate. often, it yeah. is not in a large prostate, but there's another example of how one structure can mimic a mm-hmm. pelvic floor problem and mm-hmm. vice versa. So the shy bladder is, is not normal. Constipation is not normal. Pain with sex is never normal. Post-ejaculatory pain, not normal. Pain during or after sex? Either. Is not normal. Not normal. Um, Women who have difficulty orgasming, many times it can be because of a tight pelvic floor. Mm -hmm. An orgasm is a series of rapid muscle contractions. And if their muscles are tight and they can't tighten further to orgasm, many women feel like they can't. And so that actually can be a precursor to later developing a more significant or severe pelvic pain syndrome. Wow. That's a lot of information. Mm -hmm. So also people are... Um, having any sort of symptoms like any of the ones you've mentioned is who do they normally seek help from? And if they do feel like it's something like that, is there help available? Yes. You can't be everywhere. (laughs) (laughs) No, but pelvic floor physical therapy is in. Is available. Yes, it is. But most of the time people will go to the gynecologist or to the urologist. Right. And also depending on when they graduated from school could be an indicator of how informed or not informed they are about pelvic floor issues. Mm -hmm. So pelvic floor lower tone problems such as incontinence and pelvic organ prolapse Most physicians are aware that that's a muscular disorder. That's Mm -hmm. kind of been on the treatment landscape since probably the 80s and 90s. But these pelvic pain disorders are more recent, Mm -hmm. and literature really started coming out, I'd say, 2004, where we actually started spending government dollars on these topics. And so Mm -hmm. they may be less informed about these issues and just kind of brush it aside, say, have a glass of wine or prescribe an antibiotic. When actually there, it could be indicative of a bigger issue. And if they do have these symptoms, they can go directly to a pelvic floor therapist mm-hmm. in almost every state in the United States. Oh, Primary, cool. you don't have to go to your, get a referral. Right. A physician referral is not required to legally be seen by a physical therapist, but it may be required by somebody's insurance, insurance company yeah. for reimbursement. Got it. Yes. What do you mean insurance is reimbursed for anything? Um, not really. <laughs> uh, In theory. Just kidding. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I'm usually like, should I pay 50 cents to mail this thing out or should I just save it? Um, so, but I mean, you're talking about when people notice symptoms, right? And it's great that you're pointing out those symptoms are not normal. Mm. Um, maybe you need to have an evaluation. Uh, But just in general, like when we work out and just do things to keep all the different muscles and organs healthy, we do things to keep our heart and lungs healthy. Are there just things, even if everything's working just fine, that we should be doing on a regular basis? Because it's the, Mm -hmm. you know, it's the way you're talking about the reach of what can go wrong when the pelvic floor is not working well um, makes me think I want to keep mine healthy. Are there things that you should do? So to keep it healthy, as I mentioned earlier, the innervation of the pudendal nerve has autonomic fibers in it. And so it's one of the only muscles that always has some tone in our body. So until you have a baby or advance in age, you don't necessarily need to strengthen the pelvic floor as popular magazines have led us to believe. And in Mm. fact, strengthening a pelvic floor to the point where it becomes hypertonic will cause these problems that I just mentioned. So for most of us, and and for most of us, not strong enough, you have problems, and if it's too strong, you have other problems. Yes, and generally, Mm. most people under, let's say, under the 
break it down into age brackets. Let's say most people under the age of 30 who have not had a baby, their pelvic floor should be fine just from regular day-to-day exercise. Anytime we increase our abdominal pressure, whether we cough, sneeze, laugh, or do exercises, your pelvic floor is tightening too to help us maintain continence during that activity. Mm -hmm. So unintentionally, Mm -hmm. we are exercising the pelvic floor all the time. So Casey laughs all the time. So do you think... Laughing is a really good exercise. I do, but I'm also (laughs) laughing because of the amount of times I've been... I went to a dance class with Sarah, a friend Uh of mine. Yes. Uh, who I think has been on here before. Many times. And I was, there were so many girls in their 20s in this class. It was one of those pop up classes or whatever. Mm-hmm. And I was laughing to myself so hard because there was so much, much bouncing going on. And I was thinking, literally, anyone who's had a baby and is in this <laughs> class is peeing right now. throughout this class. Yeah. And then anyone who's in their 20s and hasn't, like, has no idea, idea. what that even is. But it was just like, well, you, just you like, know that. You know like, what, what I mean? You know, actually, we do that. We do that. We do a show. So it made me laugh. And then I told him tighten my pelvic floor and got through class. <laughs> yeah. But every time you laugh, you're tightening your pelvic floor. So I got to be careful not to make too many jokes or I can cause problems for you. Okay, good yeah. point. But what's also tormenting women is they have toddlers and they get the bouncy houses for their toddlers' parties <laughs> and then they have to go in with them. They mm. may not have had time to rehab their pelvic floors yet. That's another example of like, oh no. Yeah. Actually, it's we a do. I don't know, have you ever come no. to our uh, comedy show yet? Not no, yet. no, no, no. Okay, well, you're, you'll come to one. They are funny and people have, and it's, it's pre and postnatal. So. Mm. When you have, we have a whole bunch of, like a whole showcase of comedians who have little kids. And uh, it's all about pregnancy, postpartum, early parenting, right? And the whole idea is just to like, just laugh about it a little bit. It's such a stressful transition that it's nice to just laugh and not be judged and not be, you know, stressed out. Um, But because half of our audience is women who just had a baby or is, are about to, if we have a particularly funny comedian you can kind of smell a good joke. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> but it's true. Hopefully it's... not after this podcast. No, but, I, yeah. Now I know. I was so like, looking through the notes. I was like, oh, smell a good dear. Wow. She, that, she was really funny. I could smell she was really funny. Um, okay, so you gave us one mechanism for women, and then I cut you off. And then so there are two more. So there's a few more. So as we mentioned, it can be a viscerosomatic reflex. That's disease process causing pelvic floor tightening. Um, A second issue can be biomechanical, just like I described. So it can be things like horseback riding or cycling um, on top of anatomy that maybe just isn't suited for those particular activities. So prolonged sitting, horseback riding, cycling, those could be examples of like compression of the pelvic floor. But then we can go into the tension of the pelvic floor, which can cause other problems. So that would be chronic constipation and straining. It's almost like being in the second stage of labor every time some people have a bowel movement, men and women, if they can't evacuate stool properly. Mm -hmm. So that can over lengthen the pelvic floor and Mm -hmm. the pudendal nerve and be another mechanism of which they can have problems. And the final, um, I mean, these are just general categories, can be surgical onset. And so unfortunately, we see men with prostatectomy related then pelvic floor issues and women pelvic organ prolapse, I'm sure you've seen in the news, the mesh lawsuits and things like that can actually either compress a nerve, disrupt a muscle, or cause some sort of issue in the pelvic floor that then needs to be rehabbed, the rehab itself, yes. Well, so, and, but what, are there also psychological causes? Like, I mean, sometimes we'll see somebody who either has had a traumatic uh, event in their past, um, and sometimes they have symptoms like the symptoms that you're describing. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if that could be just um, from emotions that they're holding on to. And unfortunately, yes, that is the case. There's been studies that have been done that show that incidents of sexual assault in people who have pelvic pain is not actually higher than that of the general population. When we're talking specifically when they examined pelvic pain in and the incidence of abuse in that in the regular population. However, the constipation literature differs slightly and says that people who have constipation issues have a higher um, prevalence of sexual abuse in their history than people who do not. So there's a little bit of conflicting information mm-hmm. there. I think there's more research that needs to be done. But that can be a factor as well. 
And I think a, a, another category I forgot to mention that's specifically important is there are people with congenital vestibulodynia situations. And so sometimes people are literally just born with a higher density of nerve endings, for example, at the opening of the vulva or vagina. That's usually a surgical case, but then there's secondary pelvic floor consequences from having those issues. A surgical repair? It can be a surgical repair. There's a procedure where they actually remove part of the tissue that's hyper innervated mm -hmm. in order to allow things like intercourse, mm -hmm. tampon use, and without those types overstimulating, of without causing sharp stabbing, burning pain. Because it's just too pain. painful. Yes, there's Having actually like a experience. higher density of nerve endings at the very vulnerable opening to the vagina, and it feels like burning, stabbing, knife-like pain. And some people, will, I mean, and they usually notice it either at their first sexual content ton, context. Contact? Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or when they try to use a tampon for right. the first time, it's just they can just tell something is not normal. <sighs> yes. Normally, is tampon use affect the pelvic floor? It shouldn't. In people who have normal resting pelvic floor tone and a normal vestibule, tampon use should be fine. Um, again, some people do run tighter than others, just like with any other muscle of the body. So sometimes it's not comfortable for women who have just generally tighter pelvic floors, mm -hmm. but it shouldn't be a problem with normal anatomy. Mm -hmm. Is core different than pelvic floor? So the pelvic floor is actually part of the core muscles. And as I mentioned earlier, anytime we do something that increases our intra-abdominal pressure, the pelvic floor just comes along with it under normal circumstances. So when we are doing exercises such as planks or crunches or things like that, your pelvic floor actually is active too. Mm -hmm. Once the pelvic floor can be impaired and not functioning as well as it can, then we do need to do motor control, neuromuscular re-education with our patients to get their pelvic floor to function again with the abdominal muscles. What, what other structures are included in the core that are not pelvic floor? So that would be considered the transverse abdominis, the oblique muscles in the abdomen, the multifidi in the low back, and the pelvic floor. It all together makes up the core. All together, so that would deep, be. Those deep abdominal muscles like, sort of against the front of the spine. Mm-hmm. Cool. Did you have any questions about the structure and function of the pelvic floor, Casey? No, but I am one of those people that I don't think I would have thought about it ever until now. About? And about the pelvic floor. Yeah. But I have a lot of questions, but they're more around the episiotomy. I know we're not there yet. Ooh, so I'm try episiotomy. really trying to restrain myself here. <laughs> okay. Well, I mean, that I... You but know, no, and I think it's interesting to know about. It's really interesting to know about. I wish I'd also, about. by the way, known about more about it before I... Before you had a kid? Yes, before I went into labor. Ooh, that, so that's what we're going to talk about when we come back for the second half. But is it just something that's now being explored more? Like in, in until I went to chiropractic school, never even heard the term mm -hmm. uh, pelvic floor, really, that I can think of. But I just wonder, now that there are postgraduate programs for physical therapists and are, are more people training it and teaching or going out, and, and now lay people are we're finding out more about it? Absolutely. And it's been, I mean, I've been in this field since 2000, and so it's been very exciting to see kind of how the field has evolved. Over the last 17 years, mm -hmm. there's been an exponential increase in the amount of research that's being done on these on these issues and in the media lately, especially around postpartum issues. Um, there has been a push in media attention, which is driving women to be able to find physical therapists on their own if it wasn't recommended to them by their physicians. Mm -hmm. yeah, we haven't changed the guidelines yet, though. The guidelines still do not include um, a pelvic floor assessment at the six-week postpartum checkup, mm -hmm. which it takes less than 30 seconds to do. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of surprising are that these, it's not screened. Are you saying that the, the OB or midwife should do it, and then if there's an issue, refer out? Well, actually, there almost always is an issue. I think a general rule of thumb is if a woman has had a baby, she should be given access to a pelvic floor physical therapist like they do in every other country mm -hmm. except for the United States. Mm -hmm. In many Naturally. other countries, women are not allowed to leave the hospital until they've seen a pelvic floor physical therapist. Wow. Whereas here, it's often the symptoms and complaints are often dismissed as, well, you just had a baby. Right. But we have the highest rate of stress incontinence, fecal incontinence, and pelvic organ prolapse in any of these other countries. Mm -hmm. And it can be attributed back to the fact that we don't have early intervention for the pelvic floor immediately after birth. 
And how can a doctor tell after you've given birth if there's an issue with your pelvic floor? Would it just feel, he could basically just feel it? So if there's been a vaginal delivery, Mm -hmm. which everybody understands, that's like running a marathon with these muscles that are as thick as five sheets of paper. That's it. Obviously, there's going to need to be rehab following Mm -hmm. something like that, just period. But a digital exam through the vagina can identify if there is levator ani avulsion, which is a very common problem, which is different than the episiotomy and perineal trauma Mm -hmm. that women experience. Is it one of the pelvic floor muscles? Yes. The Mm -hmm. levator ani is the, the... bigger group Mm -hmm. of the pelvic floor muscles. And it's very common for that to avulse during vaginal deliveries, correct. Mm -hmm. And so that can be identified. A second issue from pregnancy itself is a diastasis recti, which is a separation Mm -hmm. of the rectus abdominis. Mm -hmm. You can palpate that in less than three seconds on a table and determine if that's present or not. And finally, motor control. Can the woman do a contraction around your finger? Most of the time after going through a vaginal delivery or even a C-section and the weight of the pregnancy, women can no longer do a pelvic floor contraction or the muscles are tight in certain areas, they can't relax them. Mm -hmm. So there needs to be a little bit of rehabilitation to teach somebody how to do that again until your naturally functioning pelvic floor just starts to exist with the rest of your body again. Well, I would say a few things. First of all, it's interesting that you said after running 24 miles, people do seek out a physical therapist for that knee knee discomfort. (laughs) But after a 24-hour labor marathon, we don't yet naturally seek out a physical therapist for the the musculoskeletal trauma that may have taken place. Um, Mm -hmm. You've really given us a background in understanding what makes up the pelvic floor, the structures, and the core as a whole and some of the things that can go wrong and some of the symptoms that can come up as a result. Um, We're going to take a little break, and when we come back, we'll talk about very specifically how we can take that structure and function and understand what happens during pregnancy, um, if there are things we should do to uh, get ready for pregnancy as it relates to the pelvic floor and core, and then also afterwards the things that you started to touch on. So come back and... uh, listen to Stephanie and us talk about pelvic floor and core health. And uh, during the break, check out our new YouTube series, The Real Midwives of Los Angeles on YouTube. It's youtube.com slash The Real Midwives. If you're looking for the perfect baby or toddler gift, you've got to check out my first year's online collection of clothing, toys, accessories, and more. Every adorable item can be personalized with the child's name for no additional cost. Get the perfect gift for any child in your life at My First Years, your go-to source for events and occasions such as baby showers, birthdays, and holidays. There are so many great options to choose from, you're definitely going to find a special gift that any child will love and cherish throughout their life. Every child should have something from My First Years in their wardrobe. Even the royal family, Prince George and Princess Charlotte, have My First Years in their closet. And now, for a limited time, you save 10% off your first order using promo code BERLIN, B-E-R-L-I-N, when you check out. Visit them at MyFirstYears.com. That's MyFirstYears using the number 1ST.com. My First Years personalized gifts made with love, made simple. Welcome back to the Informed Pregnancy and Parenting Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Elliot Berlin, here with co-host Casey Bixby and our guest, pelvic health and rehab expert, Stephanie Prendergast. Now we're going to talk specifically about pelvic health as it relates to pregnancy and postpartum. So does the pelvic floor change during pregnancy? It does. Um, As the uterus grows and basically the weight of the baby becomes heavier, the pelvic floor is under more strain from the uterus and it has to contract a little bit harder to keep everything lifted and supported. But also as pregnancy advances, the hormone relaxin circulates through the body to help the ligaments relax. And that happens at the sacroiliac joint. And so collectively, muscles and ligaments are what gives joint stability. Mm -hmm. So if ligaments are loosening, Mm 
muscles have to tighten to provide the same stability Stability. to the joint, which is why we may see things happen as we get into the third trimester, such as stress incontinence and things like that. If the pressure of the baby, the laxity of the ligaments, and the tightness of the pelvic floor can no longer effectively close the urethra, things like that, women may start to leak urine. This is first pregnancy. Why does it change in subsequent pregnancies? Well, as subsequent pregnancies occur, it, they may be leaking from the first. Most new moms don't have time to deal with pelvic floor issues or they may not know about it. And so many times women will go into the second pregnancy with some stress incontinence and then it tends to get exasperated with that pregnancy and then the subsequent delivery. It only gets worse. Is what you're saying. <laughs> Unless you take care of it. In so many words. Um, yes, it basically just kind of sticks around. There may be a little bit that self reduces as um, women stop breastfeeding and things like that and the hormones start to to change again, there may be some changes, but typically once it is there, it may last for a period of time until it gets corrected. Is the pelvic floor supposed to hold the uterus up as well? Yes, it does. So if you have weakness there, does that affect the pregnancy in terms of baby's position or dropping early, things like that? It just seems like it's possible. Yes. Well, that's a good question. I would think with subsequent pregnancies, because usually pelvic floors are not weak Mm -hmm. with a normal pregnancy in the ages of 20s, 30s, 40s. Like normally the pelvic floor isn't weak, but it can get weakened with a delivery. And if it isn't rehabbed appropriately, there can be support issues with the the next pregnancies. Mm -hmm. Um, When you say stress incontinence, just to clear that up, is that what type of stress are you talking? Is that like the laugh, the cough, the sneeze that's stressing yes. the pelvic floor? And yes. The- so stress incontinence refers to anything that increases the interabdominal pressure, causing a urine leakage. So jumping, coughing, sneezing, laughing. All my favorite things. All the favorite things. Hmm. <laughs> um, big jumper, you're a big jumper. <laughs> I love to jump. Get um, off the table. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Um, so as the pelvic floor naturally weakens or is strained by the factors that you mentioned, the weight of the uterus or the loosening of the ligaments behind it. Um, Are there things at that point that we're supposed to do to strengthen it and keep it healthy? Yes. Or does it just happen naturally? No. So at that point, then the pelvic floor gets functionally weak because it's over lengthened. And so it is an issue of wanting to do contraction activities to start to get the pelvic floor to tighten back up again and restore normal length. But the issue that has been a problem in the past is gynecologists, obstetricians would say, do your kegels. Mm -hmm. Well, 80% of women given verbal instruction alone are unable to do a kegel properly. I'm doing one right now. (laughs) So that's the first issue. Also, and could you explain what a kegel is? So a kegel by its purest definition, would just be a contraction of the pelvic floor, the levator ani muscles. Mm -hmm. So basically a squeeze. Um, But educated women in the study were not able to do a proper Kegel by verbal instruction alone. So that's the first issue. I feel like the most common instruction is do what you would do if you were trying to stop the flow of urine. That would be a good directive, which, also which no one sense. should ever do, but yes. No one should try to stop the flow of urine while yes. you're actually urinating. But yes. um, my kids do it uh, because when we potty train them, they get one jelly bean for trying, two jelly beans if they pee, and three if they poop. <laughs> so they always they, – they stop the flow of urine and poop just – You're well, ruining their pelvic floors. I, it's not – I <laughs> – I'm going to have to change, if we ever have more kids, I'll have to change the method because I know what you're thinking. <laughs> Stop thinking that. Um, what happens is uh, they'll poop like a tiny bit and get three jelly beans, and then 20 minutes later, three more jelly beans. Uh-oh. Well, they're so, smart, so but that's they have the upside. really strong pelvic floors. Uh-oh. Too strong? Too strong. <laughs> All right. We ruined them. Uh, it's we, If you only knew how else we ruined them. Um, <clears throat> getting back to this. Uh, it's really funny. So is, is that a good description of how to do a Kegel? That's a great description, is to essentially the feeling of trying to stop urine or hold back gas would be another verbal description. Mm-hmm. But what physiologic research has shown in the last five years is it's not just about the pelvic floor being strong. It has to function with your core for it to carry over to every aspect of your life. So just having a strong peg of pelvic floor by itself is not actually going to be 
helpful or therapeutic for the issues that we've been talking about. Mm -hmm. So in addition to not being able to do Kegels by verbal instruction, Kegels alone are not sufficient, and we know that now. So it's more about motor control and neuromuscular re-education to get the pelvic floor to be strong of appropriate length, but also function reflexively with the abdominal muscles like it did before birth. It sounds Mm -hmm. like you need a pelvic floor personal trainer. In some cases you do, but Mm -hmm. again, coming on a podcast where people may not have access to that, I wanted to come up with some other strategies of what people can do at home and how to tell if these things, if they do need to see a therapist, which of course I think everyone should, Mm -hmm. but that's not always possible. So there are things that women can do. At home. Yes. Um, So you're not saying you shouldn't do Kegels. You're just saying Kegels alone are either not enough or might create, are you saying that might create an imbalance? That if, causes problems? If a person doesn't have a weak pelvic floor or an over-lengthened pelvic floor and they start doing an excessive amount of Kegels, mm-hmm. they can develop pelvic pain syndromes. Mm-hmm. But most of the time, and generally speaking, if there has been a pregnancy, whether it's C-section or vaginal delivery, the strain of the baby on the pelvic floor during the pregnancy has almost always lengthened it. So and so that would be an appropriate time, especially the third trimester if we start beforehand, to start mm. doing pelvic floor strengthening exercises. Mm-hmm. They won't hurt you by themselves, but they won't be as effective as as they would be if you do functional training with the core muscles as well. Mm-hmm. And is, so that's something that people can do at home? You have yes. like tips on how people can do that? Yes. Hmm. Share. So there's a new device out that I'm a fan of. Okay. Um, it's called the LV. Mm-hmm. And we don't recommend this during pregnancy because I'm not sure if it has been studied, but it's great to use after pregnancy. So the LV is a small device that gets inserted into the vagina and it connects remotely to your iPhone. Mm-hmm. And it tells oh, so you, you if calls, you're squeezing. Your vagina can call people. Yes, you could. If, right. you, if three squeezes in a row. <laughs> Hi, Mom. <laughs> You're talking to my pelvic floor. Yeah. Exactly. Probably could. Hmm. But it, you basically play a video game on your phone with quick flicks and longer holds using the device that's inside that your vagina. Is awesome. So yeah. If you're not doing it right, the LV is going to let you know. Is or if you're pushing like instead of squeezing, it will tell you. Yes. Wow. And it also will remind you if you're not doing your exercises, it will let you know. <laughs> it starts oh, yelling it's like at you. <laughs> it's like you a haven't f- been here in a week. <laughs> It's like a Um, Fitbit for the bit. It is. awesome. And so it's hard, I think, for women to want to do a Kegel exercise program if they're not sure if they're doing it properly. Definitely. And so if if you're sitting home and you're trying to do it and you don't know if you are, this could be one way to to monitor what you're doing, but also then you may need the help of a pelvic floor physical therapist to help you regain that neuromuscular control. Does it have a diagnostic element? It doesn't. No. Not yet. Not yet. (laughs) <laughs> no, we but we do. We are fans of the device, and I think it's very helpful in perimenopause and postpartum. Mm-hmm. I'm just going to start being my go-to baby shower. <laughs> the <laughs> LV. giving everybody the LV. <laughs> uh, be weird if, if you know. Perfect. Be weird if you're at the library and all of a sudden music starts coming out. And, mm. I don't think it does that. No? no. It's Bluetooth. <laughs> Your phone starts ringing. So... I'm just trying to take home practical advice. It sounds like you're saying when people get to the third trimester, when women get to the third trimester pregnancy, it's good to start doing some kegels and shortening, tightening up the pelvic floor. Is Mm -hmm. there a generalization on how many to do and how often to do it? Yeah, so generally um, it's recommended that women do do these exercises only once per day, and Mm -hmm. it's not that many, 10 to 15 repetitions of a good solid pelvic floor contraction. So there's two different types. There's what's called a quick flick, which is really just trying to stop your urine stream quickly. Mm -hmm. And that initiates the urogenital diaphragm, which is involved in orgasm and stress incontinence. So 10 to 15 quick flicks would be appropriate. And then the full Kegel would be like as if you're trying to hold back gas in a very crowded room. Mm. So that's a full contraction of all of the pelvic floor muscles, lift and hold, three to five seconds, again, 10 to 15 reps. Now, what everyone should know is that when you're when you breathe, your pelvic floor moves with the inhale and the exhale. So when you inhale, your pelvic floor relaxes and lengthens a little bit. When you exhale, the pelvic floor raises back up. So if you're trying to squeeze, 
You mm. want to do the squeeze as you exhale, oh, and then you're using the breath and your abdominal muscles to help facilitate a more appropriate contraction. And something as simple as doing the breath and the Kegel will engage your core and immediately make it more effective than just doing mm. these random contractions by themselves. Mm-hmm. It's counterintuitive. You sort of want to Definitely. tighten while you're breathing in. Exactly. Yeah, so you and you can override it. it too. If yeah. once you have pelvic floor control, I always look at the ceiling when I, and wiggle when I'm trying to get. <laughs> I don't know, no one can see, but that's what I'm yeah. doing. Yeah. Um, it is, but you can override the breath because you have voluntary control. Yeah, it but just it, takes you a minute also can to just maximize your normal body function by breathing out, draw your belly button in, and then try to do your squeeze, and it will actually be a better contraction, and it works all the rest of the muscles as well. Can women self-assess any of these things? I feel like they can. Um, There's a few different techniques that we can tell people to do at home. The first is to just sit and try to see if you can feel your pelvic floor contraction. If you can feel your muscles contract and relax, then you're probably in a good position to start doing some of these exercises with your abdominal muscles, like I just said. Sitting in a chair? You could do it sitting down or you could do it lying down. Mm -hmm. Lying down is actually harder because if you think about sitting, it's gravity assisted. Whereas if you lie down, it's not. Mm -hmm. Um, So actually sitting is a good place to try to see if you can do it. Mm -hmm. Another thing that women can do is to take a mirror and to actually look at the what's called the perineum, which is between the vagina and the anus. And while looking in the mirror, they can try to squeeze and they can try to push. And if they can't feel what their muscles are doing, they may be able to see their perineum move. Mm -hmm to yeah. tell them that they're doing it properly. So they can watch it. it. During a Kegel, they should see the perineum draw in towards their body. And during a relax or a push, they should see the perineum move back out and the vagina open slightly. So we want them to be able to start to figure some of these things out at home. But if they can't, again, there are people who can help them figure that out. Or is there a benefit to men doing Kegels? Not really. So this is an arguable point, though. Um, Until they get into the later stages where, as the natural aging process occurs, all of our muscles weaken. Mm -hmm. And so as men get into their 50s and 60s, there can be pelvic floor muscle weakness where it may make sense to do Kegel exercises. And it is so important for men to do pelvic floor muscle training if they are to undergo a prostatectomy Mm -hmm. because there is a huge risk factor of erectile dysfunction and stress incontinence following those procedures that it's greatly reduced if they do pelvic floor muscle Interesting. prehab mm. prior to this. Is there a Melvi? A Melvi? A Melvi, like a man, you, a you're male. You're jealous of the L- LV. LV? A Melvi? <laughs> no Melvi? I don't think so, but we have yeah. had men want to use the LV, and I don't think the, the company doesn't want to discuss that necessarily. No, no Melvi. <laughs> They're not open. a little bit smaller. <laughs> right. The LV Jr.? I don't know. Maybe that's your next thing. I'm busy. <laughs> uh, so during pregnancy and after pregnancy, you've talked about how pretty much you think everybody should have an evaluation. What are the things that happen? And is it from the pregnancy or from the birth? And, of course, there's different types of birth. Um, there's vaginal birth and cesarean birth, medicated, unmedicated. Sometimes we do other interventions. Um, how do all of these things affect the postpartum pelvic floor health? So pregnancy, if it has been the easiest and most normal delivery, let's say just unmedicated vaginal home birth happy, there still can be a levator of ani avulsion or there could possibly be a perineal tear. Um, But also just the strain of labor on the pelvic floor muscles would warrant getting a rehab program in place afterwards. The diastasis recti happens in many women during pregnancy. And And sorry, for people that don't know what that is, that's when your abs separate, right, at the top? It's almost like a big hernia between, and it can be at three different spots or the whole thing from Mm. your sternum down to the pubic bone. And the abdominal wall... the integrity of the abdominal wall is very important for pelvic floor tone. If there is a diastasis, the pelvic floor muscles can't actually stabilize because there's unpredictable abdominal pressure. And then you're much more likely to have stress incontinence, prolapse, low back pain, SI joint, all kinds of pain issues that may not manifest until 10 to 15 years after your birth. So you have the right and left rectus abdominal muscles. Correct. And this this is the six pack. I would demonstrate, but it's radio. Um, So you have the right and left rectus abdominal muscles, and they're connected by uh, a soft tissue like a white line there, right, Mm -hmm. the linea alba. When When the diastasis, which really just means separation, takes place, is that 
stretching or is it tearing? In many cases, it just stretches. I would think in a few, there have been tears because surgical repair is needed sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. But in many cases, it just stretches out. And think about the relaxin that circulates. The linea albia is a connective tissue structure. So that's one of the structures that is intended to stretch during a pregnancy. Like women should get a diastasis. Right. Um, And then sometimes it self-reduces and sometimes it does not. So it's sort of like drapes coming apart. Exactly. And then after the baby comes out and things start to flatten back down, they sort of close back up together again. So it's not uncommon to have that stretching or separation in the middle. Um, Like you said, sometimes it's just sort of under the... Under the breastbone, under mm-hmm. the sternum, um, for just a couple of inches. Uh, sometimes it's more towards the middle, like above or, or or below the belly button, and sometimes it's lower down towards the pubic bone. But it can also be all the way up and mm-hmm. down. And sometimes it's just a small opening, like a finger or or so. And sometimes it's like four fingers or and more. And also, is it easy for someone to know if they have that? Very. So the easiest way would be to vertically place your fingers Um, on the belly button, you could start at the middle. So Mm -hmm. you have your middle finger on the belly button, your ring finger off to one side, your index finger to another, and just lift your head. So while laying flat, put your fingers vertically along that line and raise your head. To engage the muscle. And you can feel, and exactly, when you engage the rectus, it will separate if there is a diastasis. So your fingers should not separate more than a half of width of a finger, and it should not go the depth of a fingernail. Mm -hmm. So in some cases, it can go very deep and it can go very wide. And so women can very easily assess this themselves at Mm -hmm. home. And if that is present, do not do crunches. You should not be doing those anyway in the postpartum period. Mm -hmm. But anything that engages the rectus abdominis, well-intended Pilates, postpartum, and yoga could be separating that further. It just pulls it further Mm -hmm. as you engage it. It just pulls it further apart. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Like when you lift your head, you'll feel it pull apart. Right. And so if you're doing stronger exercises, you can pull it more apart. Um, When you do physical therapy on that – The number one question is, is it repairable? And um, if so... And also, what do you do? Yeah, what kind of things do you do to fix it? So we will have a video in our postpartum diastasis series about the exercises because women can do this at home. Mm -hmm. Um, And there's another program called the MUTU, Mm -hmm. which stands for Mommy Tummy, which is an online program for women, which has great video resources. It's it's the Mommy Tummy. Mommy Tummy. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, So in order to close it, what you want to do is approximate the sides of the rectus abdominis by squeezing those muscle bellies together and then doing suboptimal contraction. So lightly lifting your head will generate a slight muscle contraction, which if your hands are holding that muscle together and then you lift your head, that will basically make the muscle contract and you're forcing those the muscle bellies to come together. Mm -hmm. But you don't want to do a powerful contraction because that can obviously override your hands. Mm -hmm. And so it sounds very simple and archaic, but that actually is therapeutic if they have less than three fingers of a diastasis and if it isn't, you know, deep past, let's say, the second knuckle. Mm -hmm. If it is wider than three fingers and if it is very deep, it may require a surgical repair. Yeah. Is there Um, an urgency to that? I would say so, just because I know the consequences it has on the pelvic floor. Mm -hmm. Um, The longer that the abdominal wall is not intact, the more strain is on the pelvic floor, which leads into pelvic organ prolapse. What does that mean? Pelvic organ prolapse is when the bladder or the uterus most commonly start to descend through a fascial defect in the vagina wall. So what happens is women start to feel like there's a tampon in their vagina and there isn't. And it's because the bladder and the uterus are actually coming down into the vagina. Mm -hmm. And in the most severe cases, they come out of the opening of the vagina. Is that... uh, Uh, What? Yeah, all right. I'm sorry. That don't, Google, is don't Google it and then look at the images. You don't want to know. I didn't even know that was pretty. That will that's motivate a pretty you to do your case, uh, right? Yeah. But that is very common as women age. So typically after birth, women may have a first or second degree prolapse, which is not protruding from the vagina. Mm-hmm. If that goes untreated and the pelvic floor muscles aren't strengthened, the diastasis isn't closed. Over time, that's going to protrude and come out of the opening of the vagina, usually by the age of 50. So when you have a prolapse, it's just something pushing through where it shouldn't go. In this case, the bladder or the rectum or the uterus. The bladder or the uterus can come down, but also the organs or the rectum can also come into the vagina. That's less common than the first two. Right. None of them sound great. But if they happen, (laughs) is strengthening the pelvic floor going to bring them back up? Once you get to that point, 
Your no, ship has no. sailed. So, the ship has sailed. And so, so that, that's why that like early the, intervention is important. The sling or the mesh, is that what all that is for? Yes, because okay. it has to physically lift it back up. But if you have the support of your pelvic floor muscles from birth to lift those areas, they can overcome the laxity that's come from the second stage of labor. So that's why it's important to take care of those issues so you don't get these problems later on. But this is one of the things that women are most uneducated on in recent surveys. Only 35% of women knew what pelvic organ prolapse was in a recent study that we talked yes. about today on our blog. I'm and it's, sure. Why would you? Right. You don't know that what you're doing now could have a significant impact later on. And it's on definitely sexual. motivating. Yes. I'll tell you that much. We don't want to scare women, but we do. That when there's things that you can do to maintain pelvic health through the lifetime, mm -hmm. we just want people to know that they can do this and prevent these issues. What exactly. about during pregnancy, people do the perineal massage? Yes, so that's actually a good, great topic. So the studies do show that in the third trimester from week 35 on, doing five to 10 minutes of perineal massage actually significantly reduces the number of epidiotomies. It was by 30%. Mm. And it also decreases the amount of postpartum pain that women have at three months. And mm. interestingly, the women only needed to do it one to one and a half times per week which is not a lot, no. I would say. And if you do, if women did it more frequently, they didn't necessarily have a lower incidence of episiotomy or less pain. So what they came up with was one and a half times per week, basically five to 10 minutes, just, and we have a video of this as well. Um, women can do this themselves where they're just lightly stretching inside the perineum. You want your tissues to be robust and flexible, mm -hmm. not too tight, ready to go for delivery. And that actually is something effective that women can do at home. Um, so the two things prior to pregnancy, again, starting in the third trimester, would be to do pelvic floor muscle training and perineal massage. And both of those things improve postpartum outcomes. Mm -hmm. And I mean, uh, you see partners doing it. Is that something that you recommend if they're comfortable? Or? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's something they can do to support their partner. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the episiotomy is cutting through that perineal tissue, right? It's the tissue that comes from the vagina back through the rectum. Um, are there, these are the things you can do to try to prevent that, because if I, we're trying to make it stretch better, right? Mm -hmm. So if it's a little bit more elastic, then when the baby's coming through, it should hopefully stretch and not tear. Mm -hmm. uh, we were just talking about Sarah's 11 pound baby, mm -hmm. and she stretched and didn't tear. It's amazing. Um, and which is important because a lot of times people, he, the doctors in the third trimester always like to tell you how much we think the baby weighs. And um, we're usually wrong. Um, but whatever number you get, you always start thinking, oh, my God. You know, and uh, sometimes people hear, oh, eight pounds. I don't know if I can do that. Maybe I'll just have a, a C-section. Mm. But Sarah's kind of inspiring because, you know. You can do magic 11. perineum. Yeah, that girl. Magic <laughs> That's why I'm friends right. with her, actually. <clears throat> For her perineum. Yes. Mm. You're like you have the best perineum I've <laughs> ever encountered. <laughs> why are you friends with Tried me? Tried and tested. <laughs> I don't even want to know why you're friends with me. I know it's not my magic perineum. Um, so if if there is an episiotomy, is because naturally sometimes tearing happens. Mm -hmm. um, if there is an episiotomy or a tear, is there some kind of rehab that needs to happen? I mean, there's stitching if there's a tear, but... Mm -hmm. Well, what's important is those scars from the episiotomy and the perineal tear can cause dyspronia, which means painful sex later on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so part of the postpartum rehab is to actually do manual therapy to those areas to make sure that they're realigning in a way that's soft and not irritating the nerves and the muscles around it. Um, those are techniques similar to perineal massage, but maybe more directed directly on the scar is something that we teach our postpartum women how mm. to do. Do you do scar massage in general? We do scar massage, yes, and C-section scars too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. With, uh, do you use castor? Castor. Castor oil. Castor oil. We typically just use the same, either coconut oil or biotone is what we use for external. Mm -hmm. um, internal, we use Slippery Stuff or coconut oil. Slippery Stuff? Is yes. that a brand? It is a brand. Oh. Paba Free. It's no junky stuff in it. <laughs> um, yeah, so a cesarean, are the things that you're talking about, pelvic floor issues that come up after pregnancy, here's a question that comes up practically. Uh, regularly. Are they from the pregnancy or are they from the birth? Because I 
the question comes up, maybe I should just have a cesarean birth. But it's both, isn't it? it? Correct. It is. It's absolutely both. Um, the, again, stress incontinence is common in women who may be having a C-section or have had a C-section as well. So it is both because it's the change in the hormones, the strain on the ligaments, the pressure on the pelvic floor happens during pregnancy. Vaginal deliveries are associated, obviously, with a higher levator ani avulsion and perineal risk than C-sections. But I think it's important for women to have the birth that they want to have and then know that there's things that can be done after if something doesn't go exactly as planned. Sure. And I not just... to mention, you're never, you're, there's no escaping unscathed. Uh, you're, right. Like, <laughs> I think I had a, an amazing delivery, and I felt like a truck ran into my vagina. And th- there's... And things went, like, pretty swimmingly. <laughs> so <laughs> so had they not gone swimmingly, it might have felt like... Well, and then if you have a C-section, you've just had a major abdominal surgery. It's hard. Right. So right. it's not, you know, it's not... Uh, well, there's, there's guaranteed trauma from a cesarean birth. Right. We must cut um, both the abdomen and the uterus and some other tissues and... Yeah. And also, and in my pack. delivery, I had to have an episiotomy because my daughter came out posterior, right? That's the bit, mm-hmm. the larger part, of, largest part of her head came out instead of the smallest, and so there just wasn't to accommodate her head to let her come out. They had to cut, but was she not coming down? She was totally down, and she was totally there. But to get her out, I mean, I heard him say. Well, also, I didn't know that I had an episiotomy oh, until tell- oh, after. Oh, really? Oh, that's interesting. But I mean, also meaning it was like a medical intervention, so a necessary medical intervention yeah. to get mm-hmm. her out. And it was like going to be, they also thought they were going to have to maybe use a vacuum. And then I heard that and I was like, no one's putting a <laughs> vacuum on this baby. Oh. Uh, <laughs> and out she came. Yeah. <laughs> I know your, your doctor does not do very many <laughs> episiotomies, so... Yeah, it was definitely like there was no – I think normally they also – I my understanding is that normally if you're going to get an episiotomy, they'll ask you. They will get consent, yeah. Yeah, they'll get consent for it from you or your doula, and it wasn't even that sort of situation partner, yeah. hmm. because it was necessary to get her out. So uh, – but I remember if I – I had no idea anyone like you existed – but I would have – it was so confusing because it's obviously it was a medical necessity and so here we are. And other than that, my birth, I was like super lucky. So – but I would have totally wanted this information and to mm-hmm. see someone like you because you're like – I mean, you know, you're also in general, I think, feeling terrible. But then – I'm like looking at my scar. I'm like, this is how is this not ever going right? to be normal again? I am never going to be okay. I can imagine because <laughs> yeah, it doesn't look normal, and it's no. not. It's amazing it's what our zigzaggy. bodies can do. It doesn't look good. <laughs> and now, better. now it, way better. See, but I think I would have really benefited at the time by having this information and going to see you or someone. But is it too late? Never. Yes. And so that's the thing. Diastasis can be closed at five years postpartum. And that's sometimes oh, when we wow. see women now with their leaking and having all kinds of problems. It's so how now it's just not manageable. Um, so it can be corrected regardless of when you actually go get these things addressed. Yeah. It's not too late. It's never too late. Oh, bye. <laughs> I have a few more questions in mind. Mm-hmm. Just to f- sort of finish that question about... I think people opt for a cesarean sometimes, and I agree with you. I think you should have whatever birth you want to have. If you want to have a cesarean, great. Um, Vaginal, great. Medicated, unmedicated. It's your choice. There's a lot of options. But sometimes people choose the cesarean under the impression that their your genital health will be better afterwards. They won't leak. They won't uh, have painful sex. Um, Is there correlation between type of birth and postpartum urogenital health? There isn't, actually, um, which is fascinating and surprising for people. Well, in certain characteristics. So what we look at with postpartum health is painful sex, 
um, orgasm function, urinary inco- urinary continence, fecal continence, prolapse. That's an important group of things. Yeah, those five. <laughs> Everything. <Yeah. laughs> Never a dull moment around our office, ever. No. Um, so as far as dyspronia and painful intercourse, at 18 months postpartum, there really wasn't a difference between C-section or vaginal delivery. And we know that's one woman's, many women's primary concern because they may not know about these other factors. Um, there is a higher risk of pelvic organ prolapse and incontinence and fecal incontinence specifically with vaginal deliveries compared to C-sections. So there is a slight difference in in some of those things. But when it came down to intercourse, which is often a primary concern of surveyed women, it was the same amongst both. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you do different rehab post-cesarean than post-vaginal birth? Uh, Obviously, of the scar to to Oh, yeah. And then also, can we also throw in there post-episiotomy? And (laughs) post-episiotomy. Yes. Um, With all three. For a friend of Casey's. (laughs) It's uh, my (laughs) friend, this person I know. <laughs> <laughs> With all three of the scar issues, um, scar manipulation is important during the postpartum period. Um, but it really is individualized per person based on the type of anatomy that they have now. And that can be the same or different with C-sections or vaginal deliveries. So sometimes women actually go into, let's say, urinary retention instead of incontinence afterwards because there's spasms of the urogenital triangle. And mm. they actually need to be stretched and lengthened before we can strengthen them. Whereas other women may just be leaking and then they just need to be strengthened. And that can be completely varied, I mean, between or the same with C-sections or vaginal deliveries. Um, Also, the external core, if there's a diastasis or not, can vary. And again, C-sections don't cause a higher risk of diastasis compared to vaginal deliveries. Um, and then there's issues like the pelvic girdle itself and the muscles in the inner thigh and the hip rotators. What's and the pelvic girdle? The pelvic girdle just refers to the bony pelvis. Oh, okay. So your hip bones, pubic symphysis, sacroiliac joint. And it's very it varies from woman to woman, even though it's all a postpartum plan. It's just based on what their specific impairments are and what their symptoms are. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, I sort of wonder, because you have... You know, as a doula, I go to a lot of births, and sometimes babies just don't drop. Mm -hmm. A woman will be in labor for two or three days. Um, Sometimes they'll have Pitocin making those contractions artificially stronger and stronger. Um, And the baby just doesn't come down. And in my mind, I I wonder, you know, I'm working on the more superficial muscles. Um, We do a lot of work on the glutes and piriformis in the back and the hip flexors in the front, trying to loosen and open things up. But you kind of wonder about those more deep muscles, the pelvic floor muscles, uh, the core muscles that we can't really get to during pregnancy. Just to interject, in addition to what you're saying, don't you remember when you do body work before labor? That's the hip flexors, yeah. That's not that. F- f- that feels That's, it's superficial compared deep. to these deep muscles <laughs> yeah. that are Good God. that are <laughs> yeah. inaccessible. Ouch. I'm talking about muscles so you tight. can't get to from the outside. Okay, got it, got um, it. And so you just wonder sometimes: is is it possible that those muscles are so short, so tight, and so restricted that they make it hard for the baby to come down? That has been theorized. Nobody has actually studied that yet, but that is one of the concerns with people who have had pelvic pain and going into deliveries and Mm -hmm. things like that. Like, is it more challenging because you know that there's a hypertonic pelvic floor? Mm -hmm. And we just don't know the answer to that, but I suspect, how could it not? Of course. Play a role. But I just, even on a small scale, want to take all those patients and send them to you and evaluate those, those, Mm -hmm. that musculature, that internal musculature and see what happens. One, and I hope she'll come on this podcast, but we did have a patient who who had a birth and her baby got really stuck coming out, a big dystocia. And uh, afterwards, they don't, uh, you know, doctors don't want to do vaginal birth. It's sort of like you've been flagged. Everybody wants just in case that happens again. Her, she's fine and her baby's fine. Um, but it was scary. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, she was able to find a doctor who said, well, let's see what happens, you know. But I know that she went for pelvic floor massage, internal massage beforehand, like uh, maybe at 38 weeks. Mm -hmm. Uh, She called, it was my recommendation, and she called me up afterwards, and she did it on Mother's Day. (laughs) 
And she called me up afterwards and she's like, that was the best Mother's Day ever. I mean, <laughs> she loved it. She said there was so much release on a physical and emotional mm. level. <laughs> she felt just light, free, and happy afterwards. I, I couldn't explain how happy she was with the experience. Um, she went into labor soon after that, a few days after that, That's and not. the baby just, the doctor almost didn't make it. The baby just slipped right out. Wow. First time, hours and hours of pushing. Wait, so you're saying stuck. the first time the baby got stuck, and then it was during her second she got that pregnancy release. that she got the f- massage. Yeah. And ever since then, just intuitively, I'm like telling our VBAC moms mm-hmm. who had, quote unquote, failure to progress where the baby wouldn't come down, check. Go have your pelvic floor checked. See if it's mm-hmm. tight. See if it's restrictive. And if it is, loosen it up. What do you have to lose? Mm-hmm. I think it's a great idea, and I think it gives women more confidence as well that they mm-hmm. have mm-hmm. they're going into this the best with the best pelvic health that they can, like they're ready to go. And it's kind of hard too because it's not you can't see right, you can't and you see can't it. evaluate it so much on your own. And so to have that information going into it, and just there's so labor is so unknown. You have no idea what it's going to be like. To know that, I can imagine would be so helpful. Are I, people uncomfortable? It depends. That, I mean, men and women, for men, you go in rectally. For women, you go in vaginally or rectally. If, they have, if they've had a baby, as every woman who's had a baby knows, they're like, ah, I don't even care if you leave <laughs> the room ship, while I that change. That ship has sailed. Like, oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> nope. Um, and, and women with pelvic pain, men with pelvic pain, they're so wanting an answer to their problem that – it, it, it doesn't seem that way to me mm-hmm. that they are. But, I mean, sure, people are a little bit un- uncomfortable at mm-hmm. first. But they really – most people just want these problems to be resolved and over mm-hmm. with. And hopefully we work hard with our front staff and everything to make them feel comfortable. Yeah. I mean, I have a, people apprehensive going in but happy coming out. But this one mom was just so happy coming out. That's great. And it was – you could Imagine. tell it was on a deep level. She had a lot of stuff released for her. Um the one thought that goes through my mind, and this happens to, in my mind with everything, with chiropractic, with dentistry, is how come the other animals don't have to do these kind of things? <laughs> you know, like there's no elephant LV. Uh, <laughs> can you imagine how big that would be? Um, you know, they have 285-pound babies, and and uh, I don't know. They must have some levator tearing. Uh, they it, actually, I can argue that they have because one of my colleagues has been called into a zoo for a surgical consult for pelvic organ prolapse following an elephant delivery. This oh, was wow. in Phoenix. I could probably dig up the picture. Yeah. It was quite that he's at the zoo <laughs> um, and they wow. wanted him to surgically repair it wow. because the whole uterus prolapsed and was <gasps> hanging out. Oh. And if you want to see an elephant uterus, I mean, that is bigger that than is all incredible. of our bodies combined. Wow. Yeah. Never a dull moment. Wow. You could probably live in an elephant uterus, a pregnant probably, one. Uh, that we could all fit in there and just do the podcast there. That would be relaxing in there. <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> Stay tuned. All We're right. going to dig up those pictures for your website now. <laughs> <laughs> I, wow. Uh, I'll ask Casey if you have any last questions. And also, for you, while you're thinking about that, um, Stephanie, if there's uh, something we skipped, like a most uh, common thing that everybody should know uh, or that gets asked a lot or it comes up a lot that we skipped – and by way of our closing thoughts. Well, I feel like this is great information for people to have. I would have loved to have known about it before, but it's never too late, which is also awesome to know. And I guess my questions for me, with especially relating to the episiotomy, it's more that you have to assess each individual case, right? Mm-hmm. Exactly. To really know how to address whatever's going on. Mm-hmm. Individually, it's and, you know it's not like a, oh you had this well then you need this exactly so everything is customized to the person and there can be some blanket strategies that people can do mm-hmm. such as Kegels perineal massage before and trying to start the pelvic floor strengthening after if they get stuck though there are professionals that can help them I think the biggest thing our patients say when they haven't been referred and they've been dealing with these issues mm-hmm. they are furious that somebody didn't tell them yeah. I why imagine. didn't someone tell me yeah and honestly you don't want I to feel like that how did I know not know this how did I not know this existed well maybe the physicians didn't know too sure. they may not be aware or have worked with pelvic floor physical therapists they may think everything is kegels because that's what they learned at a conference during right. you know they may have not had any information on this because it is fairly new mm-hmm. 
Um, and so if people do want to find a pelvic floor physical therapist, the women's health section of the American Physical Therapy Association website, um, or you could even just Google how to find a pelvic floor physical therapist, and it, the, the, the societies will show up where you can enter your zip code and find somebody in your area that can help with these problems. And is the LV available on Amazon? Yes, <laughs> yes. My follow-up you can, question. Uh, you can you can go have check it, out uh, the LV tomorrow for three ninety nine extra shipping. Um, the LV is available, at, or just yeah. That's I, just and what I think you it's fantastic. Another workout. <laughs> yes. What? You needed another workout program. <laughs> yeah. um, did I skip any major questions that pop into your head? I don't think so. No score. <laughs> um, where can we find you online? Um, so our website, my company is the Pelvic Health and Rehab Center, and we have locations in San Francisco, Berkeley, Los Gatos. I practice in Los Angeles, and then we have an office in Boston. Um, our blog is pelvicpainrehab.com backslash blog, and we are in the middle right now of a peripartum series. So we have probably 30 blog posts about diastasis and perineal massage and just the things that we talked about today in more depth. Amazing. And right. you're going to come on The Real Midwives and share some of these things with I'm us as honored. well. <laughs> um, I'm really happy. You know, some of our podcasts are fun. Some of our podcasts are informative. Um, you sort of make this difficult topic, fun and informative. So thank, thank you for you that. Thank you so much. And also sort of easy to understand and digest. Um, I think that the information that you shared today is super important for our core audience, which is pre and postnatal, um, but also all of the practitioners who listen to us, midwives and doulas and obstetricians and labor and delivery nurses. Um, I just feel like they're going to pick up information that will make them click and think, hey, maybe you need to be evaluated. So thank you so much for joining us and sharing with us. Thank you for um, having and me. And to our audience, thanks for listening to the Informed Pregnancy Podcast. Share us with your friends and visit us online for access to our blog, documentaries, and other pregnancy and parenting resources at informedpregnancy.com. Dot com.